to the United States, uh, to Kentucky. I'll be uh, visiting and representing SATS at the International Conference on Missions, so that happens in, in um, Lexington for the next week. So I won't be with you next weekend, but we ha you'll, you'll be in very safe hands with Reverend Johnson. He'll be sharing with you next week, Sunday. But I covet your prayers uh, for that trip, and uh, I hope to bring you a good report when I arrive back. This morning, we have quite a heavy text. And so before I even start, I'd like to pray <laughs> and ask that the Lord would prepare our hearts for it. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege of being able to gather together freely. And Lord, as we work our way through these parables, sometimes we are faced with some wonderful truths, and other times we are faced with some difficult things that we must come to grips with. And this morning I pray that as I share from this parable of the net, that Holy Spirit, you would come and that you would presence yourself among us, that you would still every heart, that you would convict us of the things that we need to know and we need to change. May you help us to see things rightly. I pray, Lord, that the work of the enemy would not prevail and that we would not run rampant with the wrong ideas. May we take away from your word this morning that which is edifying, that which convicts, that which urges and, sp and spurs us on to action. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, in my hand, I have a one-ounce silver Kruger Rand. It is 99.9% .9 silver. It's the purest form of silver you can get. And it is in a little bag. And not only is, is it in a little bag, it's, in, it's encapsulated in this little capsule, an airtight capsule, because it is so very easily tarnished. And pure silver has a tendency to develop milk spots. And if you touch it with your hands, there's a sense in which it can, it can, you can introduce oils and all sorts of funny things and, and it will start to tarnish. And it's for this reason that people keep it in this airtight container. But the reason I brought this coin this morning was to illustrate the fact that it has two types of value. It has intrinsic value. It's valuable because of what it is, right? Because it's pure silver. Because it's been mined, it's been refined. And it's, it has an inherent sense of value. It holds value. Even if I were to take this and we were to smelt it down, you're not allowed to smelt a Kruger Rand, it's against the law. But if I were to smelt this down, it would still have value because it would be an ounce of silver. But it also has a different type of value. It has an extrinsic value in that it's able to do something. And so we all walk around with paper money in our pockets, but you know, some of the finance gurus say that that's not real money, that, that silver and gold is real money. And one day when we reach a financial crisis and all of our digital money and this paper stuff that we have in our pockets doesn't help us, there's a sense in which people would revert to the real stuff that we've had from the very beginning. It has value because of what it can do, what it can buy, what it can barter, what it can exchange for. And it's very interesting that the Bible has something to say about the words of the Lord. In Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, it says this. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver, refined in a furnace on the ground. 
purified seven times. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver, refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Now we know that the words of the Lord are included in these books that we carry around, that we call our Bibles. And if you don't believe that, stick around because I plan to do a series on apologetics very soon where we'll start to address some of these things. But there's a sense in which we can argue that if the words of the Lord are like silver, then the Bible also has two types of value. It has an intrinsic value because of what it is. These are the very God-breathed words of Almighty God. It has value because of what it is. But there's a sense also in which it has extrinsic value because of what it can do for you. Encapsulated within these books that we call Bibles is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which the book of Romans tells us is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It is valuable because of what it is, but it's valuable because of what it can do for you. And that, friends, is what Reverend Johnson was teaching us last week. That the good news of the kingdom is like a great treasure. It's a pool of great price that is hidden between these pages. If only you will mine them. It is of such immense value that we would do well to sell all we have, to leave everything behind, to commit ourselves wholeheartedly to the lifelong pursuit and the acquisition of that treasure, the pearl of great price. But friends, this morning, I almost feel like I want to stop there and say, end of sermon. <laughs> the challenge is just as much as Jesus presents the kingdom in positive terms, he counterbalances this message with insight into the consequence for those who do not apply themselves to the mining of the treasures of God. This is the point of the parable of the net. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. We will be reading from verse 47 to 50. Matthew chapter 13 Verse 47 to 50. Jesus says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Heavy words. One of the reasons I love to do series like these is that you can't dodge the hard stuff. There are two main things that I believe this parable illustrates. And the first is that the kingdom is, at least for now, for the present time, inclusive in nature. If you look at the Greek words, that were used for the net in this parable, it's clear that it's not, it's not those little nets that you kind of, you see these fishermen standing on a boat and, and they just throw it over the edge. It's not that. 
The net Jesus was referring to is what they call a sane. And it was a large, fine meshed dragnet. It measured between 200 and 300 meters in length. And it was as much as five meters high. Massive, fine meshed net. And it was suspended in the water like, like a fence. And it was suspended with cork floats at the top and stone weights at the bottom. And this saying is also referred to as a dragnet because they would drag this thing through the water. Sometimes they would drag it between two boats where you would have one boat on this side, one boat on this side, and they would drag this net through the water. And sometimes they would, they would actually position the net, they would knock it into the ground on the shore, and then you'd have a boat on that end, and they would, they would run the net through the water like this in a, in a semicircle, and they would capture every living creature as they dragged it through the water. And there's a sense in which this net symbolizes the inclusive nature of the kingdom. Craig Keener says that there were 24 species of fish that have been identified in the Lake of Galilee. This is where Jesus was teaching. 24 species. Many of them were considered unclean. Many of them were inedible. You couldn't eat them. They would be thrown away. But there's a sense in which the net captures all of it. Come in, is the message. Just as the net does not discriminate, so also is the kingdom available for everyone. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, says Peter. But is patient, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. All we need to do is say yes. That's what Romans chapter 10 says. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, period. It's as simple as that. But friends, as I, was, as I was preparing this week, I, I couldn't help, I have this sense of growing concern that we take this inclusive nature of the kingdom for granted. And I believe we do it in two ways. And the first way I think that we take it for granted is in terms of the way we, we view it, the way we look at it, the way we see the kingdom, this free offer of salvation. In modern psychology, there's something referred to as hedonic adaptation. What does that mean? It's this idea that when you have a prolonged exposure to something, when, you, when you're exposed to something that is free for too long, it lessens its impact. It starts to make it seem less valuable over time. When something's free for too long, it loses its value. And many of us do not value the kingdom of God because of this continued emphasis upon it as a free gift available for us to choose when we want. The second reason I believe that we take it for granted is because how we respond to the gospel. Jesus says it's a free gift. You have the freedom of choice. We assume because we have this freedom of choice, we're in a position of power. I'll choose when I want to, how I like to, on my own terms. It seems to me that this lackadaisical approach to the offer of a precious gift comes because of this modern sense of entitlement that we have. I call it this 
pandemic of privilege. We'll have things how we want them, thank you very much, when we want them. The trouble, friends, is that Jesus then goes on to say something very concerning. It's only inclusive for a window of time. Once that offer has expired, it's finished. And this brings me to what I believe is the primary message that Jesus leaves with his listeners. And that is that there will come a day where the kingdom is exclusive. Jesus says, just as these fishermen will draw in their nets and sit down and will sort the good from the bad, so likewise will it be at the end of the age when the angels will come, they will separate the evil from the righteous, they will throw them into a fiery furnace, there will be weeping, there will be gnashing of teeth. You may remember Jesus said something like this in the parable of the weeds just two weeks ago. I decided not to share about that difficult piece. <laughs> we don't seem to talk much about hell these days. It's not popular. We live in this entitled culture where we have bought into a lie of hyper grace. God will forgive you. Don't worry about it. Sort it out later. Pastors would rather not ruffle feathers. They'd rather tickle your ears and tell you the, all of the niceties of the Christian faith. But Jesus spoke about hell very often. Very often, friends. In fact, he used this very phrase, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, seven times. Do you think he might have been trying to make a point? I'm trying to impress upon you the urgency of listening to our Lord this morning. Perhaps it is because he created that place. He knows what goes on there. He doesn't want to send you there. It is because he knows what goes on there that he speaks with such urgency to say, avoid it at all costs. There is, there is a free gift of salvation. It is precious. It is wonderful. Take it. Please take it. Some theologians try to downplay the significance and the seriousness and the severity of what Jesus is teaching here. Some will say to you, well, no, God is a God of love. He won't, sell, he won't send anybody to an eternal damnation. Some will say, well, you know, it's, it's all it really is, is a separation from God. You know, he kind of, he puts you over there and you sit over here and you see him over there and you see all of the, the redeemed and you, you long for that and so that's your punishment. A psychological, emotional turmoil. Some others will say, now hold on a second, God is holy. He will not tolerate sin. He will not make an exception. He will send those who deserve it to where they belong. And they, they'll argue and say, well, you know, God will just annihilate everybody. To put an end to the suffering. None of these views, friends, does justice to the biblical text. I'm sorry to have to share this message this morning. It's hard for me. I have a friend at Sats, a colleague. He's moved on now, but he completed a PhD with a focus on this phrase, weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. And what he did was he looked at all of the Greek words and he studied the semantic range of the Greek words. In other words, the, 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 the depth of meaning available in all of those words. What do they mean? And he engages with all of these arguments where some people say, well, it's just a psychological thing, it's an emotional thing, it's not really all that serious. He concluded that Jesus was referring to an eternal, inconsolable suffering that incorporates the whole person. Body, soul, and spirit where excruciating pain gives rise to frenzied anger and an aggressive expression of hostility towards God, where those who are in agony weep and grind their teeth at him. And as I stand here and I realize, wow, this is a hard thing to convey. Jesus said there will be weeping, gnashing of teeth, and he walked off. Left it to sink in. These things are uncomfortable, but they're important. And Jesus says it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. The parable of the weeds, the parable of the net, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the great banquet, they all tell the same story. They demonstrate there is something, something wonderful, a treasure that's on offer. Something worth selling everything over. Something worth giving up everything for. Something worth dedicating your lives to pursuing. But that there will be immense regret and suffering for those who do not act upon this free offer. That's the parable of the net, friends. As we come to a close, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes for a moment. I'd like for you to examine your hearts. Have you acted on this free offer of salvation? Jesus understands the severity of what hell is and because of that he paid the price for you and I he died a gruesome death on the cross to satisfy the wrath of a holy God so that we don't have to go there have you considered that have you acted on that offer Today is a very serious day. And I don't want to rush away here. If you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have not yet come to grips with the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity right now to do that. Right now. If you don't know him and you want to know him, I'd like to invite you to the front. And as we wait for those who might potentially want to commit themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, the second thing I want you to consider is your sphere of influence. Is there someone you know, someone you care about, who you know is destined for such a fate?
Is there someone with whom you should share this gracious hope of redemption offered by Jesus Christ? Will you commit in your hearts now to do that? Anybody, perhaps you have given your life to the Lord and perhaps you have swayed from him. Perhaps you want to read, commit yourself. Jesus uttered these words for a very serious reason. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you. That you as almighty God, holy, wonderful, glorious Savior, whose very birth and life we will celebrate very shortly, stepped down from heaven. And you stepped down from heaven, Lord, to ensure that you offered a way for us not to have to suffer the consequences of our own selves. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for every person in this room. Holy Spirit, impress upon us the importance of this teaching. May we come to grips with how priceless and Wonderful this treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ is. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for what you did for us. We thank you that at Calvary you paid the price for us so that one day you can look upon us and say, Welcome my good and faithful servant. And Lord, even as we sang this morning, I pray that each and every person in this place would offer themselves up to you and say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me to share the good news of the gospel with those who have not yet heard it. Help me in my small way to spare them the things of which you spoke. Lord Jesus, impress upon us the importance of this thing. Please, Lord, give us a sense of urgency for the gospel. Give us a sense of urgency for the lost. Impress upon our minds and hearts those whom you would want us to engage this week. Please, Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of salvation. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, this morning, we also have a...